Would you bow your heads with me in prayer today? Gracious Heavenly Father, we ask that your spirit would move in each of our hearts, that you'd be near to us, that you would work in powerful ways and change us and shape us to be more like you. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. May it be evident in our life. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Charles Coulson, better known to most of you by the name Chuck Coulson, was born in October of 1931 and died in April of 2012. From 1969 to 1970, he served as special counsel to President Richard Nixon. But unfortunately, he was involved in the Watergate scandal and he voluntarily pled guilty to obstruction of justice and was sentenced to seven months of, in federal prison in Alabama. But after this time, or during this time, he gave his life over to Jesus Christ. And after being in prison and he got out, he radically changed his life around. And a few years after that, he started what today is called Prison Fellowship. It is the largest nonprofit organization serving prisoners and their families in the world, specifically with a message of Jesus Christ and the good news. Chuck Colson faced some dark days. He faced some difficult times. And he had a famous quote at some point in his life that some of you have may, maybe have heard before, and I will quote it in part now and the rest later. He said, I've met millions who tell me that they feel demoralized by the decay around them. Where is the hope? Do you ever ask yourself those questions? Do you ever see the decay of society around you, the darkness of this world, the evil of this world, and become demoralized by it? Do you ask yourself where the hope is? Is there any hope or maybe even where God is in all of this? And is God at working and does he even care at all? We live in a scary time. The coronavirus is just one of many problems and evils that we are facing today. It has changed lives, it has changed society, it's changed our economy, and many people are scared. You couple that with a drug epidemic that is killing many. Couple that with human trafficking and sex trafficking, child slavery, child soldiers, child workers in factories all over the world. You couple that with adultery and abortion and murder and pride and greed and wars and all that is going on around us. And things look incredibly dark and incredibly bleak. And maybe some of us have said, hey, you know what? This is the end of time. Things couldn't get any worse. This world is going to hell in a handbasket. And I would agree with you that we live in a dark, sinful world. And I would agree with you that we are closer now to Jesus' second coming than we ever have been. But I would also like to say, maybe push back a little bit and be like, I don't know if these are the darkest times that have ever existed, because I think things have always been bad. You think back just in the history of our own country and world in the last one or 200 years. You think about the Vietnam War and all the people that died. You think about World War II and the genocide of millions of Jewish people and so many more. You think about World War I. You think about the diseases like polio and all sorts of other things that killed people back before there was medicine. You think about our Civil War where brothers were killing brothers and tens of thousands of people died in single battles. You go back even to further than that, even to the Middle Ages and the plagues and the wars of old, and you realize things have always been bad. They've always been evil ever since Adam and Eve fell in the garden and disobeyed God and reached out for something that wasn't theirs to take. And they decided to take matters into their own hands and become their own gods. If that wasn't bad enough, do you know that the first sin that we know of that is recorded right after that in the Bible is one of the worst ones you could possibly do. It is one brother killing another brother in cold blood and envy. Cain killing Abel in the field. 
After that, in Genesis chapter 4, we get Lamech, who has these prideful, boastful sayings about how he's going to revenge himself, which means possibly that he is going to take other people's lives. You see very quickly how dark things are from the very beginning. But I believe that God has not stopped working. I believe he still has his hands held around this world and in our lives. He's still at work. He still sustains us. He is still sovereign over all, and he still shows his grace and mercy and favor every day, even for us who do not deserve it. And praise God for that. So to drive those two points home today, both the darkness of the world and also God's grace and favor, we want to go back to the very beginning, Genesis chapter 6. Now, we had mentioned earlier that before this, God had created the world, the heavens and the earth. Adam and Eve, there was the fall in the garden. Then after that, procreation happened. And then in Genesis chapter 5, we get this long list of descendants from Adam. And you see that they're living extraordinary long times, hundreds and hundreds of years. But you also realize that at the end of every one of their lives, it says they died. The text says they died, every single one of them. They were not immortal. Maybe this was a consequence of sin. But at the very end of chapter 5, we get this mention of a man named Noah. And that will set up what comes in the next chapter. Now, chapter 6 of Genesis, in the first eight verses, I'm sorry to say, are probably some of the thorniest, most difficult passages in the entire Bible. Questions of who are these Nephilim? Who are these sons of God? Who are they? Where does this text fit? Not only in relation to what becomes before it and what comes after it, but just in general, this is primeval history. The first 11 chapters of Genesis are primeval history, meaning we don't have an exact date. We don't have an exact place where any of this happened. It's very difficult to determine. But I believe there is a thin red line that runs through this passage that we can draw out some truths from that are the main points of these verses. One is human sin and one is God's grace. And we're going to draw some implications for that at the end. But if you do have your Bibles with me, we're going to go through the passage briefly and then comment on it. At the very beginning of verse 1, it says, Now it came about. This is, in Hebrew, a very common literary device that drives narrative, something that comes after something else in this section. It says, When men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them. This is procreation. This is people spreading about about the earth. But then it says that the sons of God, what in the world does that mean? saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. Now, this sons of God language could, be, could mean angels. It could mean descendants of Seth. It could mean descendants of Cain. It could even mean rulers or kings of some sort. Many scholars hold to that last view. But the question is, is what did they do wrong? Because it seems like God is somewhat upset in the verses that follow. It seems like they overstepped their bounds. They had some sort of relations with women that they were not supposed to have. They took matters into their own hands. It did something that was not honoring in God's sight. So therefore, in verse 3, it says, Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive, or you can also def re, um, define that as remain, remain or strive with man forever, because his days he is flesh, and nevertheless his days are going to be 120 years. God's going to put a cap on how long people can live, presumably because of the sins of humanity. Then in verse 4, it's very intriguing. We get a kind of a side note here. The Nephilim, now who are they? That term only shows up one other time in the entire Bible, and that's in the book of Numbers. And people are, don't really know exactly who they are. Some people translate these as giants. Some people translate them as fallen ones because that's the verbal root of that word. That's what it means. But they were on the earth at that time and also afterward. But it comes back to the sons of man again came to the daughters of men and they bore children to them. 
And then these Nephilim were mighty men who were of old, men of renown. So they're again going back to this relationship that they are having with women. So we get to verse 5. And this kind of begins a secondary section, but it says, Then the Lord saw the wickedness of man on earth was very great. Now, this could be because of the sins of the past chapters as well, but also because of maybe what is happening here between the sons of God and the daughters of men. But whatever it is, it all comes to God, and he sees wickedness. He sees the great evil on the earth. But then this is one of the saddest statements the depravity of humanity in the entire canon of Scripture. Every thought, God said, every intent of his thoughts, of his heart, was only evil continually. All their thoughts, all their intents were only evil, only wicked, nonstop, all the time. You think things are bad now. This, is, this describes how evil humanity can be. So therefore, the Lord was sorry. He was grieved that he made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. What a sad statement to grieve God by the way we behave, the sins that we commit, the evil of this world, to the point that God says in verse 7, you know what? I've had enough. I'm going to blot out mankind and animals from this earth, and I'm going to start all over again. So some see this as an introduction to the flood because sure enough, within a chapter or two, God's going to bring rainwaters and destroy the world as the people at that time in that area know of it. And he's going to start all over again. He's going to destroy the earth with a flood. For I am sorry that I made them. That drives the point home pretty hard. But verse 8 is where we get some hope. It says, but Noah. I love those words. But Noah, actually, I was thinking of, of talking about uh, this sermon in terms of that. But Noah, what about him? Well, he found favor in God's eyes. Now, a couple points here. Number one, a question of why did he find favor in God's sight? We're going to get back to that in a minute. But what's very interesting is that last word in verse 7 that says God was sorry, God was grieved. That word and Noah's name in Hebrew are somewhat related. They sound sort of alike because that verb, that word to be grieved, can also translate it to be comforted. So it's very interesting that verse 8 starts off with, and but Noah, this man that's in the midst of this grief, in the midst of this sorrow, in the midst of this sadness and darkness, also seems to bring about favor, bring about comfort, bring about hope. He found favor in God's eyes. Now, he found favor in God's eyes somewhat by the way he lived, because we find out in verse 9 that he was a righteous man, that he was blameless, and that he walked with God. So Noah found favor in God's sight because of how he lived, but that's not to say that Noah was perfect or sinless. To find favor in God's eyes also means that God is able to grant favor. It is from God that favor and grace come. You can't just find favor in God's sight without him having the ability to give favor and give grace. So it's Noah, but it's also God. In the midst of this tragedy, God saves a family, a man who walks righteously with him, who obeys him. And all throughout the next couple chapters, we are heard again and again that Noah obeyed God's commandments. And so God saves this family in the midst of this flood that is about to happen by his grace. And once the flood waters subside, do you know what happens? Noah gets out of the ark, and God says to him very similar language to what he said to Adam and Eve and to humankind. Be fruitful. Multiply. Start over again. That's an amazing concept that God would do that that God would give us a second chance. And sure enough, he does, and he puts a rainbow or a bow in the sky to remind us that he is never going to destroy us again with that flood. That is God's favor. That is God's grace. That is God's mercy upon us. Now, you would think humanity would learn its lesson and would not sin again. Nope. Soon after that, Noah gets drunk, and the, the sin cycle continues because that's who we are. 
But listen to this, friends. It is out of this disaster, but also this grace, that God expands Noah's family. He eventually calls a man named Abram out of his country to be the father of the Hebrew people. And it is from that man and that descendants that they come into the promised land. And from their descendants come the promised Messiah, Jesus Christ, at just the right time to live a perfect life, to die for us, to die for our sins that we could not pay or repay on our own, to finally give humanity a hope that never fades, to give everybody a moment to repent, even to the point of the last breath of their life. You see, my friends, this world may be dark. This world may be evil, but God is still at work. He had a plan from the very beginning to set things in place to save this one family, this one man and his family, and to bring about his people, to bring about his Savior, and to give us hope. So no matter where we find ourselves today, I don't want you to give up hope. I don't want you to think that it's all over because it's not. God is still working and we know that he will come back one day and wipe away our tears and make everything new and give, give us the opportunity to live in his peaceful, peaceful, joyful presence forever. But here's maybe the implication for us. But until that time, how are we going to live our lives? I'd suggest to you that we live them like Noah did, that we remain righteous before God, that we remain those who walk in his footsteps, who follow him so that we can see God's favor and that we can honor him because he wants that from us. He wants our all. So it does matter how we live our life. Sure, we're going to sin. We're going to see evil. Mistakes are going to happen. There's going to be wickedness all around us and even in our own lives. But we still strive to be those who follow after God. In the midst of all that, we still trust in a Savior that can forgive all of our sins. Going back to that Chuck Colson quote, he ends by saying that the hope that is in us, the hope that we find in our, in our country, in our lives, are not in who governs us or what laws or past or what great things we do as a nation. Do you know where our hope is? It's in the power of God working in the hearts of his people. That's where hope is in this country and that's where hope is in life. Thank you, Chuck Colson, for reminding us that our hope is in God and he is powerful work, is at work, and in our hearts and our lives, despite the darkness around us. Praise be to God. Amen.